So for this problem, we're going to draw a motion map for, along the ramp for the motion of the ball as it rolls up the ramp and across the level section of this ramp. Now, I've already constructed the motion map for us. So once we have that, then we're going to construct the position time graph, velocity time graph, and acceleration time graph. But before we construct those graphs, I want to talk about what this motion map represents. So, just like every other motion map we've ever seen, the dots are going to represent the position at even intervals of time. Now, we don't know exactly how fast this object is moving, other than the fact that it's traveling at a velocity greater than zero centimeters every one second. So we don't know how much time it would actually take for it to travel from zero to 25 centimeters, or how much time it would take to go from 25 centimeters up to 50 centimeters. That's along the flat level region of the ramp. So instead of marking specific times, I'm just leaving it abstract. So this will be our first time interval right down here. Because I know the velocity is greater than zero, that's why we have this really big velocity vector. I'm saying that's the velocity at our time interval of zero seconds. That's what this little subscript means next to that V for velocity. As it rolls up the ramp, at one interval of time later, it could be up here. Because it's rolling up a ramp, we're going to assume that it is slowing down. So I'm drawing that velocity vector as shorter. Because it is not the same magnitude of velocity, I'm saying it is now v1. It's a velocity one time interval later. However, once it gets up to this flat region of the ramp, I'm going to assume that it's going to maintain its speed until, well, it reaches the end and then falls off. So that's why for my v2, it's definitely saying that it's traveling slower than when it was still on the ramp, but once it's past this time, whatever that is, it maintains its same speed. Now, it's labeled V3, just because if I want to say that it could be like the third interval of velocity. A totally acceptable way to label this, instead of V3, could also be to label it V2, like I just modified. That means that this velocity right here and this velocity right here are the exact same. So that's another way that we could label it. So you can actually see that I did that with our accelerations. One thing that hopefully we saw in the ramp lab is the amount of incline is proportional to the acceleration of an object. So the fact that while the ball is rolling up this ramp, it means that there should be some acceleration pointing down the ramp. And that acceleration is a constant value, hence A0 and A0 for both of those two acceleration vectors. Once we get to the flat region of the ramp, it's flat. So we're not going to say there's any acceleration down the ramp because, well, the angle is zero. That's why it's A1 and A1. And while we can probably assume that the acceleration right here would be A1, it is the end of our observed motion. So I'm just going to neglect labeling it. But this right here is kind of what I'm looking for when I say draw a motion map particularly when we don't have a whole lot of values to go off of. This is a perfectly good qualitative motion map. The default understanding of motion maps is representing each dot with the position at even intervals of time. Then use the length between each of those dots to draw vectors. By default, we'll almost always be representing velocity vectors as our first arrow drawn. However, you can still represent acceleration vectors on a position motion map by drawing a second vector. But when you mix velocity and acceleration vectors on the same motion map, make sure they're fully labeled. Now, the way we get the scale here is just by saying, if this is the length of our acceleration vector, that is how much each of those velocity vectors should be decreasing by, like approximately, between time intervals. Because acceleration, we can calculate as the change in velocity over change in time, assuming a constant uniform acceleration. Speaking of, I think now's a great time to start drawing these things. So we're going to start off with our position time graph because that one will be a little bit easier for us to see. So at a time of zero seconds, it is at a position of zero meters. So we're going to start here. And then Eventually, it will get up to a position of 25 centimeters, and then eventually a position of 50 
Now, this can be a little bit weird for us to draw because we don't actually have data for this. We kind of have to approximate this. However, I can start by saying, I know it should be starting off really fast with a very large positive velocity. So I'm going to start off kind of steep on my position time graph. And then it slows down over time. So I kind of curve it down. Well, once it hits that 25 centimeters, I'm just going to narrow down my um, range a little bit. And let's make that a line style. Once we hit that region, that's where we end up getting to the top of the ramp. And that's where it stops accelerating and it maintains its velocity. That means its slope on our position time graph should be constant. So when I'm seeing that, this first region from a position of zero meters up to a position of 25 centimeters. Uh, I suppose I should probably change the um, scale. 0 0.25 centimeters, 0 0.50 meters. Um, basically, I start off with a steep slope, and then it gets less steep as the object is slowing down. And then once we hit that position of 25 centimeters or 0.25 meters, the velocity remains constant. The way that would look like on the velocity time graph, we start off with a large positive velocity, and then it decreases as time goes on. Eventually, when the object gets to the flat part of the graph, it's still moving, but it's moving at a constant velocity, because there's no reason it would be accelerating anymore. And these two graphs, the position time graph and the velocity time graph, should be related to each other, because once again, our velocity is defined as the slope of a position versus time graph. So if we are showing a region of changing velocity, that should correspond with a region of changing slope on the position time graph. Our starting velocity, the velocity at zero seconds, is large. That means the starting slope on the position time graph should be steep. And then, as time goes on and the velocity gets lower, the slope on the position time graph should be less steep. And then finally, when we have a region of constant velocity, that should be a region of constant slope. Once we have that, we can set up the acceleration versus time graph. Acceleration is defined as the slope of a velocity time graph. So we can use that to kind of help us construct our acceleration time graph. This first region of the graph, where the object is slowing down, but moving in the positive direction, the slope right here on the velocity time graph is constant and negative. That means we start off with a constant but negative acceleration. The second region of the graph for the velocity time graph has a slope of zero. That means our acceleration is zero. Just like when we were seeing our velocity time graphs, which were flat, but had a region where we had that discontinuity, we don't yet have enough information to explain whether or not that should be straight up, how angled it should be. So right now, we're just gonna leave this as another discrepancy, something else that we're unable to explain at this point in the year. But to summarize what we are able to do, we can set up a motion map that represents the position of the object at even intervals of time. We can use the spacing between the objects to draw velocity vectors. We can use the change in length of those velocity vectors to construct acceleration vectors. We can justify those choices based on the incline of the surface that we are on. And we should also be able to go from a position time graph to a velocity time graph by looking at the slopes of the position time graphs. We should be able to go from a velocity time graph to an acceleration time graph by looking at the slopes of those velocity time graphs. 
And then finally, we should be able to relate all three graphs and the one motion map to one another to ensure that they are all representing the exact same motion.